Um, so good evening, and I, I'm just thrilled to see everybody here, and thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, I just want to especially thank the Gender and Women's Studies Program and the Villanova Professional Women's Network and the McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership for inviting me tonight, um, and especially Melissa Hodges and Shauna McDonald for doing all this work and, and pulling this together, so I'm just very grateful. Um, it's an honor to be here to talk with you about mother's employment. Um, I'm going to present some of my new research that was published in this book last year. Um, but um, I'm going to talk for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then I'll leave some time for Q&A at the end, um, or any comments or questions you might have. So <clears throat> before I jump into the research itself, I just want to give you a little bit of background on the book um, and how it came about, because I really didn't set out to write a book. Um, so this just kind of happened. But um, I, I was inspired by a book session that I attended at a conference. It was a sociology conference back in 2009. So some conferences host sessions called Author Meets Critics. And you have an author that comes to present um, a book that they might have. And you have panelists and audience members. And a lot of times they'll ask really great questions. Um, and they can come up with um, ways that the, the research needs to be developed further. So I went to one of these sessions, and it was um, the wonderful Pamela Stone. And some of you may have read her, her book. Um, it was uh, uh, Opting Out, Why Women Really Quit Careers and Head Home. And in her book, um, all of the women that she interviewed had left the labor force. So some left right after they had their first child. Some left a bit later um, when their kids were older. But all of the women had left. So. The audience had some questions about, well, what differentiates women who leave versus the ones that don't? But because in this particular case, all of the women had left, we couldn't really get at some of those differences. So that's kind of where this book picks up, where I, I really wanted to answer those questions. And I worked at the Census Bureau at the time, so I went back to Census. I'm like, OK, well, let's see what, what we can find out. So I started looking at some of those questions. Um, so the questions that came up and that I ended up writing about are, which mothers are more likely to opt out after they have kids? And so a lot of the focus on, on this issue has been on married white women in elite professional jobs. And this is overwhelmingly true in media coverage of the is issue. But it even goes into academic research as well. Um, so I look at whether women in professional jobs are more likely to leave. The next, I looked at how motherhood affects women's work hours. So in terms of work hours, a lot of the focus is on whether mothers switch to part-time work after they have kids. So I really wanted to look at that to see the extent to which it was happening and was it happening in some jobs and not others. So I also look at whether mothers of younger or older children were more likely to leave the labor force. And I think it's pretty, like people mostly think, well, it's, it's when you have kids and they're young and those are the women that leave. But in, in that particular book session that I went to, some of the audience members had really interesting comments. And they were like, well, you know, now we have all this scheduling of children's activities and the carpools. And you have five different after school things you have to go to. So is, is opting out extending into this school age um, period. So they wanted to know, and so I wanted to look at it. Um, and finally, I look at how birth timing affects earnings and employment. So if there's a particular effect to when you have a child, does that affect whether or not you come back to work? So in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on the first two, which are um, employment and work hours. But I'd be happy to, to answer questions on, on age and birth timing if, if there's interest in that at the end. So let's look at opting out. So opting out was coined in 2003 in a New York Times article by Lisa Belkin. And it's defined as a, a period of time out of the labor force to take care of children. And this article, like so many others, um, was focused on a select small sample of women. And in this case, there were Princeton graduates. And they're basically women that are not like the majority of the population. So, <laughs> but at the same time, they receive all this disproportionate coverage. So if you were to look at media coverage of opting out, you might see something that looks like this. So career language, briefcases. There's always a briefcase. Always a briefcase. Like when they made the cover for, for the book, um, they initially put a briefcase on it. And I was like, please don't. <laughs> Let's not have a briefcase. Uh, but briefcases, suits. So it's really a particular kind of woman that they're focusing on. But it makes their experience seem normative. So the article in the middle, which is called, is opting out the new American dream for working women. And it says, 
were in the fortunate financial position that I got to choose whether I wanted to stay at home or work. It hasn't changed our lifestyle at all. And I just noticed after a while that in there it says stroller parking photo. So that's the, the little <laughs> picture right there. It's like it has all these strollers, like that's gonna you know, overrun the parking lots or something, that there's all these strollers. So basically what they're doing is they're linking this, this story about you know, they're in this fi fortunate financial position, but they're using the term working women. So they're making that seem like that's, that's the norm. That's basically what's um, presented as the situation for everybody. So this also conveys the image that opting out is primarily happening in professional jobs. So you see at the top, you know, the woman in the hamster wheel and, you know, why opt out moms can't catch up. And it doesn't look like she opted out, but, you know, that's the image that you're getting. So their employment, when, when it's presented, um, and, and this is critical, like their employment doesn't pose any hardship. So if they work or they don't work, it's, it's not creating any hardship. So, you know, it says it hasn't changed our lifestyle at all. So not only does that minimize the impact on professional women's careers, but it also limits policy. So, because when you think about action to take, and this is the group of women you're thinking about, <coughs> immediately what comes up are, well, what are retention policies we can implement? And you've seen that in the case of like paid family leave, for instance, when companies offer programs are like, well, we want to retain our highly skilled women. And so they offer paid leave to just the select group of people. They're salaried high earners. So this is what they're thinking about. So it's important from a policy perspective to get these questions right, so we know what kind of solutions are needed. So if you look at the academic research on opting out, what we know is that women in managerial and professional occupations might face different challenges combining work and family than other women. So for example, work hours are longer. Part-time options are typically not available. Some might require travel. If you have a family, that might be difficult to arrange. Um, all of these factors, Pamela Stone and others know as like the push factors, they're pushing women out of the labor force. And they might also experience what others have called the stress of higher status. So there's more boundary blurring. So you might get excessive after hours contacts, emails, phone calls um, that extend into the evening. And it's more disruptive of that family time. So you might see that work family interference with this group of women. And research looking at the highly educated, however, finds that they're actually not more likely to opt out. There's no significant opting out among the highly educated. On the other hand, if you look at women in service jobs, office, production, what you see is that they're, they're much less likely to get benefits. And you know, benefits such as paid or even unpaid family leave. Um, they might not have sick leave. They might lack schedule flexibility. And they might not get their work schedules in advance. And that makes coordinating childcare very, very difficult. So there's no predictability there. The other thing that's challenging is that childcare itself might be unaffordable. So they, they might be priced out of work because they can't afford to pay childcare, which is extremely expensive. So, and when research has looked at this by education, they find that women with lower levels of education are less likely to keep working after they have kids. So at the outset, it's not really clear which group of women would face more barriers with employment because of the two different <coughs> sets of challenges I've outlined. And research that has looked at opting out in the past, they've either looked at the small sample of elite women, or they've looked at major occupational categories, so just like professional women versus everyone else. And that doesn't really tease out some of the differences. So in professional occupations, teachers are not like lawyers. So just lumping them in one group is not really adequate. Or they might just look at education. And that's not going to get at some of the important differences. So the first question I look at here are, do women in managerial and professional occupations um, opt out more than other women? So just quickly about my data and methods. Um, to really be able to do a nationally representative survey, um, I use the largest household survey in the United States, which is the American Community Survey, which if you ever get, please fill it out. <laughs> and if you did, thank you. Um, it's a wonderful survey, um, very large, so you can really get at some of this um, diff diversity. You can look at race and ethnicity. You can really drill into occupations, so that's why I use it. And I also use the current population survey to supplement it. So my sample includes women who are between the ages of 18 and 50, and who are either currently employed or who were employed in the last five years. 
And that five-year period is, is important because of how we collect the data on occupation. So if you're not currently working, we'll ask, uh, what was your last job um, within that five-year window? So that's basically how we can create this measure on which occupation you opted out of. So you don't have to be working for, for me to know that. Um, so I use hierarchical logistic models, um, and that's basically to account for the fact that these women are going to be nested into these 55 occupations. So <clears throat> the dependent variable is labor force participation, because I want to know if they've opted out, so are they still working? And I focus most of the analysis on whether or not you have a preschool age child, um, but I also looked at number of children. I ran all the models for school age children um, and even specific age of children. And I include all the standard economic and demographic characteristics. Um, I also include occupation characteristics. So I really wanted to know how schedule flexibility, which is basically a person gets to decide at what time they're going to start and end their work day. So I want to start at 7 or I want to start at 9 and I'm going to end at you know, whatever time in the, in the evening. Um, so that would be schedule flexibility. Um, who primarily works at home? Um, if you have a union and other types of benefits. Um, percent female in the occupation and the average hours worked in the occupation. Because some, some of the research argues that um, long hours are basically going to lead to more opting out. So I include that here to see if that's what we see. So here are some of the results. So just a high level summary of the five major occupation groups. Um, you can see this is the percentage of women in each of these groups that have left the labor force. So you can see that managerial and professional is the lowest. So only 14% of mothers are not working. And it's almost twice as high in construction and natural resources, which is mostly going to be farming. There's very, very few women, or mothers in particular, in construction. So mostly that's going to be your agriculture. Um, so another way to think about this is 86% of mothers in managerial and professional occupations are working. So most work, most work in all of the occupation groups. So, but if you, if you really wanted to look at who's opting out the least, it's going to be your professional women. And the other thing you want to think about is when we think about 86% of mothers in managerial and professional occupations are working, is we're not really expecting that to be 100% either. So we have to think about people leave the labor force for other reasons. So non-mothers, um, their opt-out rate's not zero. So you might leave for school, for health reasons. So it's actually a, a really high rate of, of women that stay, that keep working in professional groups. Can I ask you just a quick question? Yeah. That when you're saying this, are they, does it matter how many hours they're working? Is it, could it be possible that they stay and cut that? I don't know how you um, that. For this one, it doesn't matter. So any amount of hours? Any amount of hours. Participation. Yep, participation. So they're in the labor force. Yep. And I will get to the hours, you though. Yeah. Though, yeah. Yeah. It could be any number of hours. Um, some people might ask, okay, well, that's, you know, for these big groups, but what does it look for the really elite occupations? So you probably can't read what all these occupations are, but I'm going to walk you through it. So this is the 55 occupations I look at. At the top, like the top third or so, there's going to be your manager and professional. And at the very top, what you see in the blue dot, those are the women that don't have any kids. So about 10% of non-mothers are not in the labor force compared to about 19% of mothers, which are the orange. Those are the ones that are not in the labor force. So mothers are almost twice as likely to leave than, than non-mothers. But you see that it varies significantly by occupation. So let's look at the elite of the elite. So the group of women that have the longest hours, the highest earnings are doctors. And that's what I'm highlighting for you here. 4% opt out. It's tiny. It's not even different than non-mothers. So that's the lowest of, of every group. So health fields in general, which I've highlighted here, have pretty low opt-out rates. And that's a combination of the higher pay in these occupations and also the flexibility. And I'm going to talk about flexibility when I get to work hours. But health is, is an outlier here. The other groups we think of as having those high demand, long work hours, that stress of higher status. Here I'm highlighting managers, which is the top circle, and lawyers and judges. So below average opt out rates. So lower than even non mothers and other occupations. So overall, doctors, lawyers, managers have pretty low rates of leaving the labor force. 
So these are the groups that have high levels of leaving. So this is around 30%, and we're looking at service occupations primarily and farming. So this is about 30%. Think of cashiers, dishwashers, childcare workers. That's where the opting out is happening. So the other thing I want to point out here is that you have to use a correct baseline for mother's employment. Because not only do mothers opt out more in those occupations, but notice how far shifted the blue dots are too. So non-mothers are more likely to leave in those occupations. So these are occupations with high turnover. So when you're comparing mothers, you really have to think about, is it about parenthood? Or are they in an occupation where a lot of people are leaving? So that's what this is showing. So wait, so when the media communications? Yeah, so. Utilities or equipment workers, sorry? Or is, that, is that like utility line people or something like that? That has the big difference in the, between the. The media and communication? Yeah, media and yep. communication. Yep. It's a huge gap. And what you see in the professional occupations, the few professional occupations where the opt-out is higher are the ones that are really low paid. Yeah. Okay. So teachers, some of those media workers, um, librarians. So that's where it's happening. So there's a big wage issue here where teachers are not like lawyers. So they're, they're not the elite professional occupations that we think of. As a percent, did you put them as a, a very, what is this, a percent of all of those who drop out? As, as a percent of... Well, I was just thinking because you said there's a lot of women that opt out whether they're either way, right? So it's not yeah. just Mary, but I was thinking if you could say, so the ones where they're really close, it's a percentage would be like nothing at all. But yeah, there, there's some where it's not even different. Numbers, maybe the percent would show it. Yeah. yeah, and even when you control and, and models for all the other characteristics, um, looking at the likelihood that way, like they, they still stand out. Yeah. So, yeah. But in, with a percentage difference, with a lot of these, even if, even if it looks like there's a gap, it's not even statistically different mm -hmm. either way. So, so these, these are the models. Um, and I'm just pulling out a couple of variables to show you. So any number that's positive, that's going to be higher likelihood of opting out. Numbers that are negative are going to be lower likelihood of opting out. So um, this controls for all the variables that I talked about in the 55 occupations. So you can see that mothers of preschool-aged children are more likely to opt out. But it's not any different for mothers of school-aged kids. So if you have a school-aged kid, you're no more likely to be out of the labor force than, than the non-mothers, which is the reference category. And then if you want to look at that by race and ethnicity, you can see that black and Hispanic mothers are less likely to opt out than white and Asian. And for education, which is um, what we might have expected, seeing that it's these um, professional occupations where women are not opting out. You can see that with education. Um, the more highly educated are less likely to opt out, especially those with a bachelor's degree. And then occupational characteristics are, are really interesting and they're really important. So it looks like a small effect, but you have to think that this is per percent increase in flexible schedule. So for every 1% increase, you see that effect. So women that have a flexible schedule, that have benefits and are unionized, are less likely to opt out. So they have that flexibility, and so they cut back. And then this long hours issue. So you would expect that to be positive. It's negative. Women in long hour occupations are less likely to quit because longer hours are a characteristic of professional occupations. So, and that's a really, really strong effect there. So to summarize what we see, um, it's married white women with preschool age killed children who have lower levels of educational attainment and lower earnings who are more likely to leave the labor force. And if you look at the opt-out rates by occupations, it's service, sales, and agricultural that have the highest opt-out rates. So these are low-paying jobs. And just one of the reasons that pay matters is because childcare is very expensive. And if you think, well, they can get subsidies. But subsidies are only funded right now to serve one in seven eligible children. So even if you could qualify for a subsidy, and many of these people do, they're, they're not funded to actually get them the child care. The other thing that matters um, is that they have poor benefit provision in a lot of these occupations. So if you're going to have a child, so think about not having any Family and Medical Leave Act coverage. So about 40% of workers aren't covered. So not only do they not get paid leave, they don't even get unpaid leave. So if you don't have any kind of leave, then those are the women that are probably going to quit when they have a child because they don't really have too many options. 
And then when they do come back to work, just think about not having sick leave. So if you don't have sick leave and you have a child, so not only sick leave for yourself, but for your child. And I, mean, I, I have a young kid and they get sick all the time. <laughs> so having three days of sick leave in a year is a drop in the bucket. Like they'll get sick three times in a month. So, and not only does that affect, you know, when they get sick, but they have so many doctor's appointments when they're really young. So this is a really big barrier for parents. And I think it was Joan Williams that had a report that was one sick child away from getting fired. And that's true for a lot of these parents. So mothers and professional occupations, on the other hand, they have more resources. They have more financial resources so they can purchase childcare, even though childcare is really, really expensive in this country, but they do have more financial resources for that. And they also have more schedule flexibility. So they can maintain their employment because their schedules are a bit more flexible to allow that. So I wanna talk a little bit about hours because this flexibility issue is really important. So how many people here think work hours are going up? Are work hours increasing over time for everybody? Yeah. So a lot of people think they're going up. So let's talk about work hours. So on average, women work about 37 hours a week. Men work about 42. So it's about a five hour gap. And that's been shrinking over the decades. That's for paid work. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> paid work only here. Um, not, yeah, not all the second shift. Um, for part-time work, women are more likely to work part-time. Um, and a lot of that's for family reasons. But I'm gonna get into this part-time issue a little bit more. Um, when we look at work hour trends, um, in spite of hearing almost everywhere you look that work hours are going up, the peak was in 2000. So since around 2000, they've been declining. And they've declined across all types of occupations, educational groups. It's not a, an averaging out issue. Like it's, it's really declined across all groups. Um, so one of the reasons you might hear that they're increasing, um, I'll give you two. So one of them is that they haven't updated their research. So reports that I've seen cited a lot of times use data that stop around the year 2000 and they haven't done a whole lot of updates. And I love work hours, and I wish there were more reports on work hours, but it's not covered as much as it should. So a lot of times it's just, it's outdated. The other issue is that they're using a bad comparison. So if you just were to compare strictly back to 1970, then yes, we're working more hours than in 1970. But it doesn't acknowledge, it's looking at two time points, it doesn't acknowledge that there was a peak and it's declined. So then you hear the ever increasing work hours, the growing, the surge in work hours, and it's just looking at two points when it's actually, I'll show you, looks like this. So I'm showing you that it peaked and I, I put the hours right where it peaks, so about 43 for men, right around the year 2000, and about not quite 38 for women around the same time period. And you can see I've highlighted the recession years, work hours dipped during recession years, but they basically dropped and they've been pretty steady. And even if you pull this out up to this current year, um, they're, about, they're pretty flat, so they're not going up. So you really can't take women's hours here highlighted in, in yellow, take the 1970 and just compare it straight to the 2010s. Um, because in, in the 1970s, women were coming into the labor force. You know, we expect that they're ramping up their work hours, but the really critical thing is that there was that peak and decline, so there's no increasing of hours, or for men either. For that matter, it's been a bigger drop for men. So if you wanna look at occupations, that these are known for having long hours, you see the same pattern. So physicians, huge drop since the late 90s. Same for lawyers. And managers are working fewer hours now than they were in the 1970s. So among all these groups that you would think there are high work hour demands, it's been dropping. And you'll see the same pattern, whether this is the current population survey data, I could show you American Community Survey, it's the same pattern. So the context of work hours is important because work hour decline should be favorable to mother's employment. So in general, um, long hours have been argued to be a fundamental obstacle to mother's employment, and research finds that women are less likely to work in and more likely to leave long hour occupations. So this is good that they're, that they're declining. Um, one issue with looking at mother's work hours is that a lot of times they typically only look at this part-time, full-time divide. 
And that's important because that's going to capture, um, it, it's not going to capture a lot of the ways that mothers modify their work hours, which I'm going to show you here. So the second question I have is, do mothers shift to part-time work when they have kids? So same data and methods for the most part. Um, the main thing that I'm changing is that um, these are only women who are currently employed because we only ask your work hours if you're currently employed. And the dependent variable changes to usual weekly work hours. And I added a couple of occupational characteristics that are specifically interesting to work hours, such as um, the percentage of workers in the occupation that are on call and the, per the percent that are paid overtime. So this is what we see. So if, if you look at mothers compared to non-mothers, on average, these are work hours. Mothers are scaling back about 2.2 hours a week. So it's pretty small. So certainly not going to push you into part-time. For professional, it's, it's higher. So mothers in professional occupations are scaling back more. They scale back about three hours a week. And it's virtually non-existent in construction and production. So if you want to look at the detailed occupations, the ones in orange are your managerial. You can see that scaling back is happening a lot more there. So much longer, uh, much larger cuts in hours. So this is the number of hours that mothers are scaling back in all of these. So remember how physicians and surgeons had the lowest opt-out rate, 4%. So they have the, the largest number of hours that they're scaling back, 8.5. So basically their continued employment is supported by this ability to cut their hours. And they're not working part-time. These are doctors. They're still working 40-ish hours a week. But that scaling back is enabling them to keep working rather than working 50-some-odd hours a week. They're now in the 40s. Um, so scaling back in, in the occupations in white, you see it's a lot smaller. The one that's really sticking up, that, that 2.1 right there, that are working more, those are childcare workers. And those are mostly going to be women that started a childcare business after they had kids. So they're working longer hours. Um, it's pretty much the only exception. The other ones are not statistically different. Um, so if you're working in some of these other occupations, you, you may not have the flexibility to, to scale back. You might be an hourly worker. And if you're getting low wages, you might not be able to afford to scale back. So if your hours are shorter and you're going to take a direct pay cut for doing that, then you might not do that. Ooh, wrong way. So again, looking at all the 55 occupations, the other thing I want to point out here, um, again, the blue dot is no kids, orange is kids. That blue line is 35 hours. That's the cutoff for full-time work in the US. So what, what you want to look at is that most of the scaling back between mothers and non-mothers is happening on either side of that blue line. So very few occupations are going to scale back from being a full-time to a part-time employment situation. So what this tells us is that in a lot of those studies that use a part-time cutoff, it's going to miss that. So most of the scaling back is happening on one or, or the other side of that line. So that's the most common mechanism that mothers are going to cut back on work. It's that couple hours a week, and you're just not going to see that. And that's consistent um, and important, because if, if you keep that full-time threshold, um, you're not going to lose your benefits in all likelihood. Um, you're probably not going to significantly change what your job is, so you're keeping the same type of work. So it's more of a you're increasing efficiency in the hours that you have. Maybe you take less work home. Um, maybe you take off a few hours here and there to do the carpool and go to kids' events. But it's, it's a pretty small shift that's just not getting captured. And it's also more prevalent throughout the occupational distribution. The other thing that's important is that this is really, if you look at the part-time jobs, this is really an occupation thing. So, it's, it's going to proxy for being in a service occupation. Those are service occupations that are on the part-time side of the blue line. And you'll see that non-mothers are there too. So it's not really about parenthood that they're working part-time. It's that they're working in jobs where part-time hours are common. So if we look at the models, these are work hours. So you can read them as this is how much uh, mothers are scaling back or working more, as the case may be. 
Um, so you see that unlike the opting out models where it only mattered for preschool age kids, here you see that mothers of preschool age kids and school age kids are both cutting back. So preschool are working 2.2 hours less, school age kids not really all that different, still almost two hours less a week. And compared to white mothers, actually this is white women, sorry, compared to white women, um, black, Asian, and Hispanic women work longer hours. And in models where, uh, it's not what you're seeing here, but if you look at motherhood, um, you see that black mothers are working longer hours than black non-mothers, for instance. So they're very unlikely to scale back after having kids. Um, those with more educational attainment um, work fewer hours. And again, that's consistent with being those professional occupations that have the flexibility. And here you see flexibility matters. If you have a flexible job, you're cutting back. If you have a job with benefits, you're cutting back more. The average hours in the occupation is interesting because this really speaks to occupational work hour norms. So you see that it increases your hours. So if we think back to physicians, you see that they do cut back a lot, but they're not cutting back to 20 hours. They're still working 47 hours a week because it's a long hour occupation. So here, if, if the average work week for women is 37 hours a week, and you're in an occupation that works, say, 40 hours a week, what this says is you'll work 38.5. So you're not getting up to that 40, but you're still gonna work longer hours because you're in a longer hour occupation. So basically, work hour norms really matter for how people end up responding. So to summarize, scaling back is really small, so two to three hours a week. So it's really important to think about that when we're measuring mother's employment. And those most likely to scale back are gonna be white mothers with higher levels of educational attainment who have schedule flexibility and benefits. So most mothers are not shifting into part-time work. So it's really important to use that continuous work hour measure so you're getting those small differences. So to summarize overall, what we see is that across all occupations, most mothers are working, most are employed, most are employed full-time. And the recent small decline in mother's labor force participation was concentrated among low-wage workers. So as the service sector expanded since the 1990s, these are jobs with low wages, few benefits, and this is a really important contributor to the stagnation of women's employment that we've seen since the 90s. We haven't seen any significant declines in employment among mothers in professional occupations because they're more likely to have the resources and the flexibility to maintain that employment. So this is what I want to leave you with. And as an occupation person, <laughs> like occupation really matters. So in the United States, we have uh, benefits that are negotiated typically at the employer level. So what that results in is a really stratified workforce and it has unequal provisions. So few women in the United States even among those in professional occupations, have benefits that are comparable to European countries. So it's inadequate for everybody. Um, and everybody's gonna struggle combining uh, work with parenthood. But women face different challenges, and they stem from structural occupational inequalities. So my results show that opting out and scaling back, and who does that, is really reflecting what's going on in those jobs. What are their resources? What kind of jobs do they have? So, the work family strategies are a reflection on that. So thanks for inviting me, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Let's give a round of applause.